It's lovely to read it. Well, uh, section six. <coughs> Excuse me. I'd like to cite some secular examples of how history gets written and how it gets interpreted. The answer given by some folk to the question, who do we think we were, is inevitably conditioned by events subsequent to the events written about. I wonder if there is, in fact, any such thing as an absolutely objective and impartial recording of history. I'll make reference to four publications by way of illustration of how history gets handled. The first is a book published in 2012 uh, by the Oxford University Press. Here it is, and written by A.J. Joyce. Now, Joyce, an Anglican vicar, priest, working in Birmingham, in England. And it's entitled Richard Hooker and Anglican Moral Theology. Hooker lived from 1554 to 1600 and wrote the famous treatise entitled Of the Laws of Ecclesiastical Polity. Uh, the Reverend Joyce tells us that his purpose is to demonstrate that until now, now don't forget, Hooker died in 1600. That's quite a while ago. But the author says that uh, until now, nobody has truly understood Hooker or his writings or his life and impact upon Anglicanism. And he claims that he alone has Hooker in true perspective. I have to say that his monograph published last year and which set me back 60 pounds, look. Am I stupid or stupid? I don't know. 60 pounds. Oh, well, never mind. Uh, when you read it, his case is highly persuasive. Um, the reader could be quite readily convinced by the author's claim that 400 years have gone by and only now are we beginning to grasp the highly influential Richard Hooker's place in church history. My personal interest in Hooker first arose when reading theology at King's College London in the early 1970s and perceiving Hooker to be a moderate and sane voice amongst the stridency of the Reformation years. Now, that interest was already aroused because Hooker was appointed to the post of master of the Temple Church uh, in 1585 at the early age of 31. Uh, the Temple Church still stands in the Inns of Court. You know the Inns of Court are uh, barristers, uh, trade unions, and, uh, and, and housing. Uh, the church still stands in the Inns of Court just off Fleet Street in London, and I first entered its portals as a teenage law undergraduate. Now, in that church, Hooker had preached regularly to congregations consisting of the great and the good and the leading personalities of the English legal profession. The Reverend Joyce has pinned his colors to the mass, claiming that at long last only his 2012 book lets us see Hooker in the true light. It's a bold claim. Uh, we'll await the reaction of others steeped in 16th and early 17th century church history and equally learned in the life and work of Richard Hooker. Anglicans are asking, who do we think we were? And that will impact how they answer the question, who do we think we are? And of course, the newly appointed Archbishop of Canterbury is already asking those questions out loud and is to be commended for that. My second example of secular history writing, uh, like the others I'm going to mention in a moment, is a book dealing with matters of human conflict in war. Uh, this book was published uh, in 1980 uh, by the SCM Press and is entitled From Hiroshima to Harrisburg, The Unholy Alliance. Uh, beginning in 1939, it, the gifted American author, uh, Jim Garrison, takes us on a terrifying journey from the development and dropping of the atomic bomb on Hiroshima 
to the near meltdown of the nuclear reactor at Harrisburg, USA. Now Garrison, Jim Garrison, is a skilled and persuasive author. He writes factual history with pinpoint accuracy in every detail, but his main aim is to influence the outlook of his readers concerning what the human race has done to itself and to the created order in the development of weapons of mass destruction. I commend the book to you, but be ready to be deeply disturbed. Uh, who do we think we were, or who do we think we are? We were, and still are, and forever now will be, the people who can destroy themselves and their own planet many, many times over. My choice of a third secular history book is different from all the rest mentioned because it's a work of future history. It's written as though events far into the future had already happened or are now happening as we speak. Now, it's not a work of science fiction. But it's a serious attempt to extrapolate from past events in order to anticipate and prepare for a potentially catastrophic future. It's entitled The Third World War, The Untold Story. And it was written by General Sir John Hackett and published by Sidgwick and Jackson in London in 1982. Uh, General Hackett was a prominent military leader and went on uh, to pursue an academic career after retiring from the forces being known as the outstanding soldier scholar of his time. For seven years, he was the principal of King's College London, where I and many other Salvationists have studied and, and still study. And later, he was visiting professor of classics there. The book looks into the future based on the state of the world at the time of writing, and then records unapologetically the course and events of the Third World War as though these had already taken place. It's a remarkable forage into future history. Who do we think we were becomes who do we think we'll become. And I wonder why the army uh, should not attempt to peer into the future in a similarly prophetic manner. But that would take the exercise of spiritual gifts. My fourth and final example of secular historical writing is a volume I found I could not put down. It's by the Australian documentary maker and author Craig Colley and is entitled Nagasaki, The Massacre of the Innocent and Unknowing. Uh, it's here. There's the um, the, uh, Nagasaki, The Massacre of the Innocent Unknown. The 2011 publisher is Portobello Books London in cooperation with Alan and Unwin of Australia. The book's power is found in its direct engagement with eyewitnesses to the horrendous bombing of Nagasaki, not Hiroshima this time, but the second assault on the city of Nagasaki following on from the destruction of Hiroshima. The main portion of the study is based on personal interviews with Japanese survivors of the attack. Now, these interviews uh, include an interview with a doctor, a Japanese doctor, Japanese primary school teacher, all Japanese, a cook, a nurse, a radiologist at the local hospital in Nagasaki, a newspaper publisher there, a college student, a postman, a tram driver, a shipyard draftsman, a Japanese Franciscan monk, and a warden of the local prison. Then in addition to interviews with those people, we have uh, interviews also with the American military personnel involved, including the crew of the military bomber plane that dropped the bomb on Nagasaki, having decided not to drop it on Aizaka, 
which was the primary target because of the weather conditions. It was too, the cloud cover over Osaka was too dense, so they moved on to the pre-planned alternative uh, destination. And in the book, we meet also members of the Japanese government at that time, the emperor, the prime minister, and the foreign minister. Personal accounts are also included from Japanese military staff. Input from American and Soviet Russian personnel adds to this powerful mix of testimony. The reader is drawn in irresistibly. The skill of the writer allowing us to stand in the shoes of this diverse cast of living eyewitness characters. And so perspectives shift all the time. Hardly any two witnesses give matching accounts of what happened. Now you've watched uh, trials and the witnesses get up in the witness box and, and can give contrary stories of having been eyewitnesses to the same event on a street. And this, it's exactly like that in this work, but on a much uh, broader, deeper, profounder scale. Uh, so we're faced with choices as to key facts. We, the reader of the book, uh, have to choose as to key facts as well as choices as to the meaning of the facts. And all of this points us to the subjective and highly elusive nature of history writing. And when we talk about writing our own history in the army, we must never be blind to that. There's always subjectivity involved in however well we do it. So I, I pause now to ask, in relation to that work uh, about uh, Nagasaki, who do these people think they were? Who do they think they now are, having endured so much? What does come through from the Japanese testimony is pain, but ever-present dignity. Now, I want to close this segment of my paper with the words of the American leader, General Curtis LeMay, this is recorded in the book, who compared the American atomic air raids uh, on uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki with the USA's March 1945 conventional bombing of Tokyo, the Japanese capital. And this is what General LeMay said. We scorched and boiled and baked to death more people on that night, on March 10th, March 9th and 10th, than went up in vapor at Hiroshima and Nagasaki combined. The general goes on to say he could not understand why anyone would be unduly disturbed by the events at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Each attack was for him just another day at the office. And we're tempted to ask, who did he think he was and what did he think he was doing? <laughs> 